The president, who had to deal with vi escalating Klan violence in the South, was Ulysses S. Grant, elected on the slogan, Let Us Have Peace. Elected in 1868, Let Us Have Peace. Andrew Johnson is out of office, and now Grant comes in for eight years. Now, most treatments of Reconstruction end their account of national politics with the election of Grant and focus on the South. But, and the Grant administration generally it has had a kind of bad reputation among historians, historically speaking. In the rankings of presidents that I've mentioned, Grant turns out down somewhat toward the bottom, although lately he's been rising. His stock has been going up. Um, in the he's moving up the ratings because he at least did for a time try to defend the constitutional rights of black citizens in the South. Previous generations didn't think that was worth much, but now historians putting more emphasis on that aspect of the Grant administration see him in a slightly more positive light. But the main image of the Grant administration remains political corruption. Um, even though most people agree that Grant was not personally responsible, he didn't pocket any money, he was rather naive in trusting some of his subordinates who turned out to be serious crooks. Um, he lacked political experience. Um, as I said last time, corruption was inherent in the political machinery of that uh, time. The war had tremendously expanded the amount of money coming into the government through taxation and other things, uh, railroad bonds, sale of land, taxes, tariffs, all sorts of things. Um, the, at that time, the political parties still depended on how did they support themselves? They, de they depended on either contributions from office holders, the so-called spoil system. <coughs> party people got appointed to office and they were supposed to give some of their salary to the party. But also corruption is part of a way of supporting the party as well as individuals uh, grabbing money for themselves. The, 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 the famous scandals of the Grant administration, the whiskey rings, they, they all arise in some ways out of the Civil War, the whiskey rings. The war had led to high excise taxes on many things, including whiskey. And officials, internal revenue officials, kind of took bribes in order to not charge these whiskey distillers the proper amount of taxes so that they would save a lot of money by bribing the officials uh, and this apparent, there was a whole ring of whisk, the whiskey rings uh, doing that. There was the Credit Mobilier scandal, which actually originated under Lincoln and Johnson. It was connect, not Grant, but it came out in the Grant administration. Um, Credit Mobilier was a kind of construction company um, created to construct the, trans, the Union Pacific Railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, which was launched during the Civil War. It was a complete... I don't even know what the word is, you know, it's, it was a kind of fraudulent company because the directors of the railroad set up this company, which was, they were also the directors of, and they sort of made contracts with this construction company at a very high profit to, um, to build their own railroad. They're basically paying themselves to build their own railroad. Um, in order to get this scheme arranged, Bribes were given out to members of Congress. All sorts of members of Congress were bribed in order to get this through Congress, the arrangements for the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Later on, quite a several members of Congress were either expelled or disgraced for taking these kinds of bribes. There was the Treed Ring in New York City. I've mentioned that. Um, and so, you know, so corruption was quite endemic, North and South, in the post-Civil War period. There's no question about it. And this, the point for us is not to say, oh, look how bad corruption was, but that the prevalence of it begins to undermine the unity of the Republican Party. Um, we have to look at changes in the Republican Party itself. The old radical group is, not, is eclipsed, increasingly. Some of them die, like Thaddeus Stevens in 1868. But increasingly, leadership in the Republican Party falls into the hands of a new group called the stalwarts. The line of division is no longer moderates and radicals, it's stalwarts and the group that emerges call themselves liberals, liberal Republicans. The first 
political group in American history to call itself liberal, 19th century liberal. We'll see in a minute what that means. Not current liberal. But the point is, the Republican Party comes to be dominated by powerful state machines, usually headed by members of the Senate, like Roscoe Conkling, I mentioned him last time, from New York, or James G. Blaine of Maine, or Olive Morton of Indiana. And they're not, politics is reverting back to its Jacksonian sort of era. In other words, it's much more political than ideological. The ideological impulse of the Republican Party is now sort of being replaced by just the loyalty to the party is the main thing. And keeping the party in office is the main thing. And reaping the spoils of office. It's not so much devotion to highly ideological uh, principles. So emotional catchphrases like the bloody shirt begin to replace the issues of Reconstruction. What is the bloody shirt? And it is literally, it was Oliver Morton, who I think in 1866, in a political campaign, held up a bloody shirt at a campaign rally. And he said, this shirt was worn by a Union soldier who was killed in the war. This is his shirt. Every bullet, every bullet that killed this man was fired by a Democrat. Vote Democratic, you are voting for the people who killed this soldier. Vote Republican, you are voting for the Union, the nation, etc. In other words, the best issue was to refight the Civil War over and over again. And the Civil War becomes the line of division between parties and between sections increasingly, replacing the ideological, the Civil War which already happened, uh, uh, the ideological issues of the 1850s and early Reconstructions. Um, the intense fight with Andrew Johnson had also put a tremendous emphasis on party unity. And these stalwarts insisted nobody could break with the party or because, you know, look what happened under Andrew Johnson. These stalwarts would, are much more pragmatic than the radicals used to be. Um, they're interested in votes. They're power brokers. They deal with whoever has votes. They deal with interest groups. So, for example, they're not pro-labor, but they're not anti-labor either. Labor has votes, and they will support things like laws for an eight-hour day or things like that. The radicals weren't in favor of that, actually, because they just believed in this legal equality. So my main point is that political corruption comes to be associated with the Grant administration, with changes in the Republican Party, the rise of these political machines dominating the party. And the stalwarts, though, are strong supporters of Reconstruction. Why? That's a lot of Republican votes down there. You don't just give up a whole lot of states which are under the control of the Republican Party. So in 1870-71, it is the stalwarts and the Grant administration that push through Congress what are called, well, what their official title is the Enforcement Acts, but the South calls them, and the Democrats, the Force Acts. These are specifically acts to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendment, to enforce the civil rights and political rights that have been granted to African Americans in the Constitution. And remember, both of those amendments have a clause at the end, Congress shall have the right to enforce this amendment. Here is legislation to enforce it. And the Ku Klux Klan Act, there are three of them, but the most important, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 is one of the most far-reaching laws in American history. It pushes the constitutional revolution of Reconstruction to the limits and beyond the limits of anything anyone could have possibly imagined. It makes local crimes federal offenses. Today, if there is a murder in New York City, that is a local crime. That, is, that person is tried in state court. That is a crime against the law of New York City. There is no federal relationship to most individual crimes, crimes of violence, assault, murder, etc. Now, there are certain classes of crimes, like hate crimes, that invoke a, uh, a trigger, a federal response. And in a sense, the Ku Klux Klan Act is the predecessor of all of that. It says that acts of violence intended to deprive a person of constitutional rights become federal crimes. 
and they are to be tried in federal court, not state court, and punished by the federal government. And the federal government can take action to suppress such crimes, even to the extent of declaring martial law. The president is authorized to declare martial law if combinations of violent people are making the enforcement of the law impossible. So as I say, this takes crimes which had always been under state and local authority and turns them into federal issues. And many Republicans balk at that. The Democrats are opposed, but the, what will become the liberal Republican, the people who, who now say the aggrandizement of the federal government has gone too far. This is too much of a expansion of the power of the federal government over local criminal um, jurisprudence. Grant uses the Ku Klux Klan Act to crush the Ku Klux Klan. He does. He sends, he declares martial law in South Carolina where the Klan is completely running amok. He sends federal marshals into Alabama and other places. They ra if you, and what does it mean to declare martial law? It means no habeas corpus. You can round people up and just hold them in jail. When you do that, and if you don't treat them very nicely, they will talk and they will start implicating higher-ups, and eventually the Klan falls apart. Many of the leaders flee to Canada. Here is a real irony, right? Before the Civil War, it was fugitive slaves fleeing to Canada. Now you have leaders of the Ku Klux Klan fleeing to Canada to escape the jurisdiction of the federal government. Some of them are put on trial in South Carolina. Lower-level people are given a slap on the wrist with the promise never to do anything again. But the Klan is destroyed. They actually destroy the Ku Klux Klan in 1871. And 1872 becomes the most peaceful election in the South in this, in this whole period. So if you're willing to send troops, use the power of the federal government, and um, play rough, you can actually suppress these kinds of terrorist organizations. But the post is that many people in the North say this is, an, uh, this is too much. The federal government sending troops back into the South, this is a violation of liberty, it's a violation of local authority, and it begins to shatter the Republican Party's unity on Reconstruction. 